There's this uh, very iconic scene in the original Jurassic Park where uh, Ellie and Ian are sitting in a car together when Ellie asks Ian to give her a very simple explanation of chaos theory because he's been talking about it so much. Right, you've heard of, you've heard of chaos theory? It's the essence uh, of chaos. John doesn't subscribe to chaos theory. That's, that's chaos theory. Mathematician. Chaotician. Chaotician. Now, Ian, being a horrible flirt, uh, he proceeds to just, like, grab her hand and, uh, like, very sensually drop these uh, cool droplets of water on it. Then he asks her to observe that every time he's doing this, uh, the, the water droplets appear to be taking different paths down her hand, assuming you, you dry in between water droplets. Now, he further goes on to say that if you zoom in very tightly onto a human hand, you'll see lots of little hairs, lots of minute uh, and minuscule imperfections in the skin, and each one of these things has an impact on the path that a single droplet might take which on the whole makes the system very uh, unpredictable. And that, in summary, is his explanation of chaos theory. This idea that you take a very complicated and intricate system, and that will always lead to a very high level of unpredictability. And he basically says that whenever you're in this situation, that is what we call chaos. Predictability in complex systems. Now this explanation is reiterated throughout the movie. In fact, the movie goes so far as to imply that um, Ian's intuitive understanding of chaos is the reason why he's the one who knows that something horrible is definitely going to happen at Jurassic Park. Boy, we're hit being right all the time. And while all of this is very interesting, and I should also say that the movie does get some things right about chaos, I'm sure you can tell by the title of this video that a lot of what they say about chaos is, uh, is very misleading. And to give you guys a better sense of what I'm talking about, to give you guys a good sense of what I think the movie gets right and what the movie gets wrong, I'm going to give you a very simple and non-technical explanation of what mathematical chaos really is. Whenever mathematicians and physicists want to study or find chaos, they always restrict their attention to certain types of systems. Now, what these systems have in common is that they always have a starting position, and they also always have a set of rules or a fixed setup that allows you to determine how the situation will progress from the starting position. So let me give you some examples, actually. Let me give you three examples. So number one, the setup in this case is a large pool table with three big circular bumpers. And you launch a pool ball from a starting position somewhere in between them. Number two. So in this case, the setup involves drawing a specific parabola and a specific line and you start from a point on the x-axis and you move vertically up to the parabola, then horizontally to the line, and then back down. And then you do it again. You go vertically up to the parabola, horizontally to the line, and then back down. And you basically just do this over and over again. All right, number three. The setup in this case involves a bunch of magnets that you place on the ground. Then you take a rigidly hanging iron weight from some starting position and you let go. Now, each of these systems, I hope you can see, has a starting position and a set of rules. But also, all of these systems happen to be chaotic. So what do I mean by they're chaotic? Well, there are actually a lot of uh, technical requirements for uh, mathematical chaos, but basically it boils down to two separate requirements. The first requirement is an extreme level of sensitivity. So each of the systems that I mentioned is extremely sensitive to how and where you start. So for example, if you launch a pool ball from here and label the bumpers A, B, and C, you would go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on repeating until the ball stopped. Now if you change the angle ever so slightly, a change so small that the human eye can't even see it, you get A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, C, A, C, A, C, A, C, A, B, A, C, A, B, A, C, A, B, A, C, A, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, B, A, B, A, B, C. 
This situation is also extremely sensitive. If you start at two points right next to each other, you get wildly different behavior. In the same way for the third example, if you let go of two weights that are less than a millionth of a degree apart, they take very different paths and they don't even wind up in the same place in the end. Now, for this situation, by the way, there's actually a very uh, beautiful way of illustrating just how sensitive the situation is to where you start. So let's say you pick colors for each of the magnets. Then what you do is you color every point on the plane by figuring out where a weight launched directly over that point lands. So for example, if you launch a weight over this point, it lands on the red magnet. So we color it red. So if you do this for every single point, you get an extremely beautiful fractal. And the intricacy of this fractal really illustrates you know, just how sensitive the situation is to precisely where you start. So what this sensitivity tells you about chaotic systems is that even though you can compute what is going to happen from a starting position, if your measurements are even slightly off, if they're off by even a little bit, you can't really predict what's going to happen. Um, people who study chaos theory tend to summarize this by saying, in a chaotic system, the past predicts the future, but the approximate past does not predict the approximate future. So a wonderful, wonderful application of these ideas is the weather. So weather, as it turns out, as best we understand it, is a chaotic system in the exact same way that the three examples that I gave before are chaotic. In other words, it is very sensitive to initial conditions. In other words, if you're off by even a little bit when it comes to measuring the weather, it can have dramatic outcomes in terms of your predictions about future weather. Which is why, by the way, forecasts never seem to go beyond say, seven days, or at best, two weeks. And that's because if you measure the weather today, even though we know the rules and the equations by which weather evolves, if you measure the weather today and you're off by even the smallest amount, that could mean the difference between there being a tornado in two weeks or not. Now, this effect is sometimes called the butterfly effect. The idea that a butterfly flapping its wings in Africa could mean a tornado in Iowa. Now, this sensitivity, this sensitivity to initial conditions or butterfly effect, is definitely the aspect of chaos theory that is the most popular. It's definitely what's inspired the most uh, fiction and movies and so on. But there's another ingredient that you need for chaos. Sensitivity is not enough. Consider this system. So let's say you start with a number and you repeatedly multiply it by a billion. So you just multiply by a billion over and over and over again. Now, if you start with two numbers that are very close together, you see that if you keep multiplying by a billion, the resulting numbers will get further and further apart. So this system is very sensitive to initial conditions. But on the other hand, it's just exponential growth. It doesn't appear chaotic at all. The missing ingredient here is called mixing. Now the idea of mixing is that if you in your system take a bunch of starting positions that are very close together and then allow the system to evolve observing the behavior of all of these starting points, then these starting points should wind up everywhere. They should wind up covering every nook and cranny of the space of possibilities. It should look like you put your starting points in a blender and they wound up everywhere. And these two properties together, both the sensitivity and the mixing, are what define mathematical chaos. There's this uh, joke in the movie where something unpredictable happens and then Ian is just like, well, that's chaos for you. See, here I'm now by myself uh, uh, talking to myself. That's, that's chaos theory. Uh, but now that you have a stronger feeling of uh, what chaos, uh, mathematical chaos, technically is, uh, I hope you can see that the situation 
is a lot more interesting and complicated than simply saying, oh, look, that's unpredictable, so chaos. The movie just seems to have uh, this very like fatalist attitude about complicated uh, systems in general. The whole reason chaos theory is even in the movie to begin with is to give some kind of scientific backing to Ian's intuition that something is going to go horribly wrong at the park. That things, you know, always go wrong when people mess with forces uh, beyond their understanding. Gee, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here um, staggers me. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, after all, what chaos theory tells you is that uh, if you ever encounter a chaotic system, then if you can't measure the present with 100% accuracy, then you can't really predict the future. But you, you can't, I mean, there's no context in which you can measure the present with 100% accuracy. Um, so what does this mean? Does it mean that you can never uh, predict anything? Is the whole concept of predictability uh, a mirage? Is science, like, I, like how, how do you do science in these contexts then? I mean, could you ever have something like Jurassic Park? You know, if, things, if something like the butterfly effect is true uh, for a system, like if something as small as the flapping of a butterfly's wings can have a massive impact on the future, then it doesn't seem like we should be hopeful uh, about having like very good predictive models of reality, right? Well, not, 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 not quite. So here are some basic reasons why chaos is not nearly as horrible as it seems to be. For one, even though chaos theory uh, does say that, you know, whenever you have a chaotic system, you cannot precisely measure the future um, from the present. But there's nothing stopping you from computing the odds of something happening. In other words, if you allow yourself to shift away from wanting to know the precise future to being able to, you know, do odds on the future, then the situation becomes a lot more interesting. I mean, chaos theory does not uh, stop you from doing something like that. I mean, consider the very basic idea of, say, something like flipping a coin. Um, flipping a coin uh, satisfies some of the properties of chaos in that, you know, whether the coin lands heads or tails depends very sensitively on how you flip the coin. You know, even if you sat around all day practicing, I doubt you'd ever be able to get to the point where you could flip a coin um, in a way where you know it will always land heads. I mean, that's just how sensitive the situation is. So in that sense, it's similar to a chaotic system. But even though that's true, we all know that a coin lands heads 50% of the time and lands tails 50% of the time. So the second issue I have is with this idea of complexity. So the three examples that I chose were specifically chosen because they're actually very simple. This idea that chaos theory is somehow inextricably linked with the uh, complicated systems is not true. Simple systems can produce chaotic results. But also it's worth mentioning that complicated systems don't have to lead to chaotic results. I mean, think about something like the solar system. You know, you have the sun, you have, you know, eight planets and Pluto and like all these other like little things floating around and they all are exerting gravitational forces on each other. So you'd be reasonable in suspecting that this situation would descend very quickly into chaos, but it doesn't. All the planets just kind of neatly revolve around the sun in a very close to circular orbits. So there you have it. Simple situations can sometimes lead to chaos, but complicated systems are sometimes not chaotic at all. A third point I want to make is that uh, chaos theory specifically deals with situations where, you know, you have a starting position and you have a set of rules and then you back off. So you do not intervene in the system. So, you know, you, you allow the system to progress from the starting position naturally. Now, Jurassic Park had a saboteur. They had a villain. So it's not as though the compli as complicated as Jurassic Park was, it naturally descended into chaos. A villain intervened to make things go badly. And in the real world, if you encounter a chaotic situation, there's nothing stopping you from intervening and making sure the situation goes well. So a fourth reason why chaos is not as horrible as one might think it is, is all of the amazing and exciting mathematics and artwork that has come out of it. I mean, 
That fractal that I showed you before is just the tip of the iceberg. There is a cornucopia of amazing artwork, images, just things you can derive so much artistic and mathematical inspiration from that would not exist if it were not for mathematical chaos. All right, so I hope from seeing all this, you realize that chaos theory is a very rich and interesting field of study and that its conclusions are way, way, way more exciting than the basic idea that everything complicated is unpredictable. Peace.